So first, I would like to thank all the organizers, especially Benoit, for this uh, very nice invitation and for this very long time that I have to try to explain you a little bit what uh, is multimode optics. Okay. Uh, I'm always very glad to come here. Uh, actually, I was first student a long time ago here and then lecturer several times and then organizer of uh, one week uh, on nonlinear optics. I'm, 20 years ago, something, and two years ago on a uh, one month session uh, on nanophotonics. So, and now I'm back to lecturing here. So it's always a great pleasure to, to be in such a nice place, and one of the nicest in the world, I think. And it's a good place to work. Okay. Not only to work, but to work. And it seems that you have worked a lot, uh, considering the program. So I was, uh, <laughs> I was expecting very tired faces, but no, it's okay. <laughs> Seems that you are uh, resisting. <laughs> so considering that, I, I will try to be slow, and so you can sleep if you want, uh, and uh, then try to to go in a, in a in a way where you can understand and follow everything. Of course, it's not possible to do it on slides because uh, six hours is something like 400 slides and uh, too lazy to write all these uh, light slides. So I will do most of the, of the lectures on, on, the black, on the green board, okay? And um, so I will tell you a little bit uh, about multimode optics, okay? So mainly multimode quantum optics, but of of course, it has a lot of connections, as you will see, with classical optics. And then uh, we will uh, see that uh, this notion of mode, which seems very obvious at first sight, is uh, full of uh, interesting things. And, and then it can lead uh, rather far in the understanding of things. Uh, so everybody knows what is a mode, more or less. Okay, so Everybody has in his mind this kind of... Uh, idea that it is using a mode, there's many modes, I have few modes, I have, I have a single mode laser. Everybody knows when he is building a laser, when his laser is single mode or multi-mode, of course. But as you will see, it's not so uh, easy to, to define. Uh, this was important in, in classical optics for a very long time, but it, it turns out that it's also a very interesting concept of quantum optics quantum optics. Uh, so this subject started a long time ago now. And uh, people at first were interested in, in single mode quantum optics. So uh, in, a, in a given mode, one has quantum states, as we will see in more detail uh, later. And uh, this mode can be either classical or non-classical. Classical meaning that it can be mimicked by a cl classical field of being Maxwell equations with a little bit of classical fluctuations on top. And uh, then there are other states of light which cannot be mimicked by classical ways. And this has this so-called non-classical or pure quantum states. And you have heard already a lot uh, about that. Uh, Gert, Maria, uh, that's it. Uh, yes, before. OK, so you know what is a single photon state, what is a squeeze state, what is an entangled state, I hope. so. But all that in single mode, not for entangled state. On entangled state, you have to go, of course, to two modes at least, to two-party system. And then if you want to deal with uh, EPR state, with uh, Bell states and things like that, you have to go to four mode states because you have two directions, two parties, and in each party you have these two polarization possible, so it's four mode states. So you see that this has increased step by step the complexity of systems. And, and multi-mode system is, is a key for complexity. And if you want to go to complex quantum system, you have to, to be a bit careful about that. Um, and uh, this subject of more complex quantum states has emerged now also a long time and in different directions. The first one was on imaging, in images. So an image is a transverse variation of field. 
So in terms of degrees of freedom, of course, it is a lot of degrees of freedom. For example, if you use a CCD camera, the numbers of degrees of freedom will be the number of, of pixels that you are using. And uh, so it can be a lot. So the, this domain of quantum imaging, of spatial correlations between uh, different parts of uh, electromagnetic field and has been a lot, been the subject of a lot of uh, different um, uh, investigations. Then there, there is also the time or frequency domain which has been considered. Of course, you can consider single frequency uh, states of light, which is uh, something which was at the beginning. But then you can consider pulses, so something which is broadband in frequency. And uh, then there are also many nice uh, properties in that. Uh, one of the motivations to go further like that in complexity, because of complexity is not uh, a name. I mean, you, you try always to simplify things, not to make them more complex. The, the, one of the, the trend, uh, the motivation was quantum information. In quantum information, of course, you want to use quantum resources to enhance the different uh, uh, parts of the, of the computation or of processing, but uh, you, you have to compete with classical computing, classical information. And uh, of course, this classical information in classical uh, computers are very, uh, very good and they're progressing very quickly also. So uh, in order to match them or even to be better, for example, to factorize big numbers, you need to, to deal with big uh, registers, quantum registers. Uh, big quantum registers means high number of modes to deal with at the same time with entanglement between all these parts. And this is not easy, but of course you have to, to do it. Otherwise, uh, quantum computing will be just uh, a simple curiosity and not something which perhaps will be useful in the future. But anyway, what is interesting in this domain of work is that uh, in the way, of course, one encounters the interesting things, interesting and basic things. And uh, of course, uh, not only the aim, but all the path is interesting. So this is what we, we were doing. So as I told you, modes are interesting also in classical optics. And this has been also the subject of a lot of development. I will give you a little bit uh, a flavor of it because of the birth, uh, you know, the, the availability now of devices which are very useful to handle these modes, which are first the multi-pixel uh, detectors, CCD cameras, photodiode arrays, all these kind of things are able to take in the multiplex way information, and multi-mode information on the light. And then the, perhaps even more importantly, the, like here or in many other devices are SLM, spatial light modulators. So these things are able to change the phase and the intensity of the light which is going through at different points, okay? So you can then make images and pictures and video games, but also you can make physics with that. And this has been a, a development uh, for the recent years, a very important one. Okay, so this was the introduction. Uh, okay, I have notes here, handwritten notes, uh, not very well written. Uh, so, uh, so you are of course free to write with me, and, but also perhaps we will scan them. And uh, okay, you will do what you can with them. Okay, <laughs> and uh, then there will be some time, some of course uh, results of experiments, uh, experimental setups, and things that is very long to draw on the blackboard. So uh, yeah, there will be also a little part of on slides. Okay. Okay, so let me begin now. So I am allowed to go here. <laughs> That's okay? Yes. Okay. So my first part, of, of course, is modes in classical optics. Okay, so first <clears throat> I need to use a... a a tool which is very often used in uh, optics, uh, which is uh, the complex representation of, of fields, uh, because it's more convenient. So you know when you have a, a monochromatic field 
which is a real field. Electric field or magnetic field are real quantities. So they should be written this way, but it is very convenient to go in, into some... So I write it this way if you want. To use a complex representation, the real field being the real part of the other, okay? So this is uh, convenient because here when you have, uh, especially in nonlinear optics, you have to multiply things like that. So you have to remember trigonometry uh, uh, formulas, okay? Here it's much more simple, okay? You just have to remember the, the, the product of two exponentials, the exponential of the sum, and that's almost it, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is easy to do in a monochromatic field. When it is not monochromatic field, it is what is called a, to go from the real field to the analytical signal. You, you have already seen that. Analytical signal is a, in many books. It's a mathematical concept. So when the field is not monochromatic, of course, your field is something which can be decomposed as a Fourier uh, transform of components. Let me write them this way. Okay, so this is a Fourier transform of the field, so whatever it is here. And of course, it depends on R on both sides. But since the field here is a real quantity, okay, this is this one, the, there is a connection between uh, the negative part and the positive part of the frequency axis. So in what you find very easily because of the reality of that is that the E of minus omega is a complex conjugate of E of yes, omega. Okay? So there, there is too much information here. Because your negative part of the axis and the positive part of the axis have the same information. So you can keep only the positive part And this is what is called the analytical signal, okay? And I, write, I will write it this way, E plus. It's very strange, it's an E plus and there is a minus sign, but it is a, the way that people write it, okay? Well, see, here there are two, two sides, two parties in the community of opticians, the one who are using minus omega t and the one who are using plus omega t, okay? It's the same, but if you take one, Party, you have to then to stick with it, okay? Not change in the middle. And why I prefer this one? Because uh, then it will be quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, of course, you know that uh, the temporal variation will be the, the one coming from Schrodinger equation with a minus sign when the energy is positive. So this is why there is a plus here, okay? So positive energy side of of the system. Okay, so I stick with it. Of course, when the field is monochromatic, this is equivalent to that. Okay, so now I have a complex field, and in complex field I can use some kind of Hilbert space uh, structure when I choose also a scalar product in, in this thing. Okay, this is what I will do. So we have, in, in addition to the Hilbert space of modes, of uh, states of light, states of quantum state, okay, the usual Hilbert space in quantum mechanics. Then we have another Hilbert space of modes, of fields, okay, of Maxwell equations. And of course, there will be an interplay between the two. So this was just a tool that we will use all the way. And then at, at some stage, we will put a little carrot on top of it because we will go to the quantum domain, okay? So what is a mode? Definition. So I will take a very general, the most general possible uh, definition. It, so I will, I will write it this way, F1, I put a one because there will be others after. Okay, it's a complex quantity. Okay, so it is on this side. It is a vectorial quantity because it's an electric field and it depends on the position and time. And it is just a normalized solution 
I write it because it's important, of Maxwell equation. Okay, so F is a field, it obeys Maxwell equations. So two, two equations, the, the one which, for example, if it is in free space, which uh, it will be here, it is just that the D'Alembertian of that is zero, okay, the propagation equation. And then that the, the, it is a divergence-free quantity, okay, the divergence of F is zero. So this is the equations with or without uh, boundary conditions, depending on uh, what you are interested in after. But what is perhaps more important here is that it's normalized, okay? Normalized solution means that if you integrate F1 of R and T, it's square of a space only. But if you do it, it's one, but uh, sometimes you are dealing with plane waves, for example, and plane waves are not normalizable like that in a total space. And you like plane waves because they are simple for mathematics, for Fourier components and all that. So it would be nice to, to deal with uh, plane waves. So we stop the integration over some space of volume V, okay? And this is one. This, this space of volume V is the one you encounter also in quantum optics, at the beginning of quantum optics, the one which enables you to define modes, frequency modes, we'll come back to that later, okay, in a, in a way that you can uh, digitize, okay? So sometimes this volume is called quantization volume. It's not related to quantum optics. It's just a volume which enables us to work with Fourier series instead of Fourier transform. Okay, and since we are not so good in mathematics, it's better to use some finite sums instead of uh, integrals and delta functions and uh, Lebesgue uh, measures and things like that, which are behind that if you want really to do things well. Okay, but we are not mathematicians, we are physicists, okay? And anyway, plane waves are not physical. So, okay, they are just mathematical tools that uh, are uh, convenient. Okay, so the real field uh, will be related to that, but if I assume that I have a single mode field in F1, so this is what people say, I have my field, my laser is emitting a single mode light uh, in TM00 beam, okay? For example, single mode light means that my field E plus my complex field of R and T is something which is proportional to F1 of R and T, but of course with some amplitude that I call, I call it um, E0, E1, of course. And E1 is a complex number. Okay, so I have separated and by this way the, the shape of light, including polarization shape, uh, spatial shape, temporal shape of the mode of the light, and, and the amplitude, which is a complex amplitude, which means that I have here the intensity and the phase of the thing. And of course, if my field is in single mode, then I need only to know that. I, I need to know which mode it is, of course. And then it, when I work on this mode, I, know to, I need to know how much watts or milliwatts uh, I have. This is the, the amplitude and the, what is the phase of it. Okay, so this is the first step is that I have a single mode. But what is interesting here is that I am able to, to build something more complicated but also more useful, which is a mode basis. Okay, starting from this one, I can build a whole series that I will call Fm of R and T, okay? So I, I skip R and T. F1 being the first one of this one, okay? But then I can, I know that Maxwell equations are linear, so they have basis of modes. Okay, mode basis is that. And this is a orthonormal basis 
orthonormal, meaning that I have this kind of relation. So integral over always this volume V, in which I assume that all fields are living, okay? No, nothing around it. And this is R and T dot Fn vector of R and T. This with R is delta Mn. Okay, so each one is normalized to one as the first one, but then they are orthogonal to each other. And here I have my scalar product. Okay, so this gives this Hilbert space structure to the field. Okay, okay. So th then, since it's a basis, I can now decompose any field. Can be written as so in its complex form, of course, R and T as a sum, because since the, these modes are, are in not finite number, but it's an infinite number which can be labeled by uh, integers, uh, numerable. It's EM, FM, RNT. Okay? So you see that all the, so once we have this basis used, okay, all the information about the field is given by this EM column vector that I will write like that, okay, which is E1, E2, an infinite column vector. Yeah, so I have a Hilbert space of modes on which I have my basis, okay, one, uh, and this basis is uh, of infinite dimension here. Okay? So you see that uh, when I have my mode basis, the, the degrees of freedom of the systems are fixed by the number of modes on which I will expand my field. Okay? So number of degrees of freedom and number of modes used, useful for the system are the same. Okay? And this is in the mind of people. Okay? A mode is a degree of freedom of the system. So degree of freedom, a complex degree of freedom, okay? Each mode is correspond to a phase and an amplitude. But, uh, so an infinite number of phases, infinite number of, of amplitudes in the system. Okay, so since EM is a complex number, so I can write it with, with the real part and imaginary part. Okay, EXM and EYM being real and what are called the real being what is called the quadratures. Because, of course, there is an I in between, so the phase of these two parts are pi over two. So usually people write that in a, in a plane. I have an EX. EM plane for a given EY plane for a given M value, okay, and a given field is EM here with real and imaginary parts. Okay, these French people call that a Fresnel plane. They are the, they are the only ones, I think. <laughs> and the American call it phaser, phaser plane. I don't know, in, in Sweden, or <laughs> you don't want to? Uh, of course, we call it the Fresnel plane. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but there are as many Fresnel planes as there are modes, okay? <coughs> and of course, in this, this is not a plane for the polarization. It's not the real direction of the field. It's a plane in this complex uh, is Hilbert space or partial part of the Hilbert space, which gives you the quadrature or, if you prefer, the phase and the amplitude of the field, okay. which are the polar coordinates of the same thing. Okay, very simple all that, so it's, it's good. It's, I do only simple things, okay. 
So let us, of course, look at examples. So the most popular one is a plane wave, traveling plane wave, traveling. First one, which is a, the example of a mode which you find in all quantum optics and quantum mechanics books, okay, because it's the basis to quantize the field. So they are based on the solution of Maxwell equations, which have the shape of a plane wave, okay, e to the a k l r minus omega r t with polarization epsilon l. Sorry. So really, I cannot go beyond. <laughs> so There's physical limits. OK, and this is normalized in this way. OK, because if, int if I integrate that, uh, of course, it will give one. Oh, sorry. I, uh, sorry, sorry. It's normalized with one over V here. Sorry, sorry. Okay, it's better because uh, then uh, f is uh, a quantity which is dimensionless. So the the dimension is here. So this is a field. Okay, a real one. So here is the thing. Not something which is dimensionless. Okay, and in order that it is, it gives one. Uh, and then it has to fulfill some things on the, on the three three components. Uh, you remember all that? I will give it back. I mean, all the constraints on KL and omega L. Okay, so I have time, so I can do it. I think it's better. So the, the KL, so the wave vector that is used in the plane wave uh, basis has three components, which are not anything. They, are, they belong to a grating okay, of possible values. So the, it's NX, it's, uh, X component is a multiple of 2 pi over L, where L, okay, is, I assume that I have taken a cubic volume of, of sides L, okay? So V is L3. So I've, I need my 2 pi over L. This gives me a periodicity over the, the box, and this gives me a Fourier series basis. So I need it. Fourier, coming from Grenoble, I, I am, of course, so obliged to. So NX can be any integer, positive or negative, K okay, in this direction or the, the other. And the same for, of course, Y and Y. So let me a bit faster. Z. OK, so this defines the extremity of the K vector, OK? In a grating, so I don't. So my k vector is somewhere here, and then I have to define the polarization. So polarization, because it's a transverse field, belongs to a plane which is perpendicular to the k vector, and in this plane I can choose two polarization. Okay, it can be two linear. I have the choice. In order to have a basis, I need only two, and I can take what I want. Provided that it's the orthogonal normal, I can even take complex ones uh, with corresponding to a circularly polarized light. Okay, so I have two values that I call uh, one and two, epsilon one and epsilon two for polarization. So there is so far no L in all that. L is a kind of common. Label, it's, okay, it's not an integer, it's a, series, a list of numbers, which are the nx and y and z, and uh, the, the one or two giving the polarization. Oop, <laughs> I begin to destroy it. <laughs> I can hide it or Okay. So this, this is what is needed to have this relation fulfilled, okay? The, the orthonormality uh, of the system. Sorry? Don't you have a constraint because of the wavelength? 
No, uh, since I don't, I didn't say anything about K. Okay, K can be any wavelength, can be gamma rays, uh, uh, radio waves, everything. Okay. Then, of course, when I use it in a, in a given uh, system, uh, physical system, of course, I will have. A, this, this is now m mathematics. Then, of course, for physics, I will take part of the basis. Of course, we don't care about gamma rays, uh, part of the, this basis so far, perhaps later. We, we care when we have a divergence, <laughs> so because most of them are coming from, oh, <laughs> are coming from that. OK, it's better. <clears throat> OK, so this is good for mathematics, because then you can use Fourier tools, and you, for example, the Parseval Plancherel relation, and things like that. Okay, so it's very nice, but it's not physics because a plane wave, meaning something which has the same amplitude here and on the moon and on uh, uh, Betelgeuse star and anything, is not physical, of course. So you have to use something which is limited in space and time, and uh, so you can use other things, for example, standing waves. Standing waves are uh, superpositions of these. For example, if you have uh, two mirrors in front of each other, of course, the mode which uh, belongs to, which is uh, possible in the cavity, uh, linear cavity, will be the one which is zero on both sides. Okay, and then this will be a standing wave. This one is a traveling wave. Okay, this is a wave which goes out of the volume after a while. Okay, so I don't go too much detail of that because, of course, uh, the, when the cavity is not just two planes, two mirrors, but a uh, box of some shape or a waveguide or something like that, this is this kind of basis that you will use, not standing waves off, made of two or few traveling waves, but eigenmodes of the cavity that you are using. So this is a, a meaning of modes, which, are, uh, which is very common. Okay? The, Modes are modes inside some boundary conditions. Okay, so boundary conditions, cavity modes. And in this case, of course, the volume which is here is a real one. Okay, it's not a fictitious thing to make you happier with mathematics, it's a real one. For example, what is called cavity quantum electrodynamics is uses this kind of thing. Okay, a real cavity and real modes inside this cavity. Um, modes are real anyway. Okay. But there are many others. Then I, I consider Sub, sub basis, that is to say, basis which are basis of a part of this very big Hilbert space of gamma rays uh, and uh, everything. So these are these paroxial modes. They correspond to the fact that there is in the problem in the physics a given axis that I call Z here, and my field is traveling mostly in this direction. Okay. So it means that if I look at the transverse part of the field, it doesn't vary too much at the wavelength scale, because otherwise, if it varies quickly at the wavelength scale, then it will diverge a lot. And then, of course, we'll not be any longer along the that direction. OK? So this is uh, um, something which is very well known as mode. So transverse variation, much bigger than lambda. In the, in the plane, in the x, y plane, okay, which is transverse plane, the plane of image. And in this, in this case, you are the well-known and famous uh, hermit Gauss or La Laguerre Gauss modes that you know well also. I don't write them. Okay, they are either the hermit Gauss modes which are factorized in the x, y basis. Okay, so have the T, M, P, Q, basis with Hermit polynomials 
along the x and the y direction. So I don't write the details. Or you can use uh, the polar basis, uh, the cylindrical basis, with z, uh, the radial direction here, and the angle. Okay, and then you have modes which are factorized with on this r phi z basis, which are the Lagergauss mode, which are rather famous now because uh, they carry an orbital angular momentum. The one you choose with, uh, with some twist in the phase, okay? And this can be used also at the quantum level. So I will not go into this part of quantum optics, but it's a very in interesting part. Okay, so these are the, this mode, so uh, Hermit, Gauss, Hermit Gauss mode, let's say. So the most famous, or oh, Laguerre. Okay, so now these are basis for just a part of, if I take another beam in another direction, I have to take the new basis along this other direction, and things like that. So this is good when you have cavities, which have a good shape for this kind of modes, which are the laser cavities with, between two mirrors, which are spherical mirrors, or OPOs also, okay? Any oscillator which is bounded by spherical mirrors will, have these kind of modes uh, as uh, eigenmodes. So in the same ID, but now not in space, but in time, I have my slowly varying envelope, slowly varying envelope modes. Now in the time part of the degrees of freedom. And now I have a temporal variation It's a bit like that. On time scales which are much bigger than the period, optical period T, femtosecond, 2.5 femtosecond, something like that. In this case, uh, I, I, a convenient way is to write the field E as a carrier. Okay, so it's a plane wave of wave vector K0 and uh, mean frequency omega zero. And then in front of it, I have uh, the envelope, which I will call, I don't call it, but I can take a basis, which is Hermit goes also. Hermit goes P of T minus Z over C. So here is a carrier. Okay, this part, and here is the envelope. Okay, so well-known way to describe uh, pulses of light. And then I have to take a basis of the shape of the pulse, and the convenient basis, we will use it later, is the one which uh, expands over the hermit ghost modes in time. Okay, or in space-time, in time, in traveling time. Okay, so the first one is just this one, the, Gaussian shape of the pulse. Then the second one is the one which has uh, this shape. Okay, I don't know if I will be able to write it. Okay, like something like that with the two. You see, with a zero in the middle and five phase shifts in the two parts and so on and so forth. Good basis for pulses. Okay, then now I, you can imagine anything as modes, of course. Uh, you are just limited by these parts, but it's not such a big one because the Maxwell equations are simple in vacuum, of course. But there are basis which are uh, well adapted to the, the system that I mentioned at the beginning, which are the SLM and the CCD cameras and the arrays, which are the pixel modes. The pixel modes are something which uh, look like that. Okay, zero everywhere and some value in some space, in some limited part of uh, space and time dimension. So it depends on what you put here. Okay, there are different pixels possible. The first one, of course, is space. Okay, we have spatial pixels. So these are the 
you show me a, a CCD camera, of course. Uh, I took it round. Usually it's not round, it's <laughs> rectangular. Okay, but anyway, it, uh, you have a signal corresponding to the light intensity over any of these pixels. So it's good to, to use this basis. In this case, if I take my x-axis here, a possible basis for this one, for example, is something which is uh, non-zero between, okay, so I don't write it, it's too long, and then between the two parts of uh, other thing. Is it a basis? Actually, it is, uh, so I read it, it was here, it's also normal, because, okay, I can choose the height here so that it is normalized to one, and I can choose, uh, if I take non-overlapping pixels, of course, they are orthogonal, orthogonal, okay, because there are zero the different places, but they are not modes of everything, of course, because uh, they, they average the field over some space. But if you have, they have, uh, according to Shannon's theorem, they, it's a good basis for uh, fields which have not too high uh, frequency spectrum, uh, spatial frequency spectrum. So they are, they are good for all fields which have not Fourier components, so spatial Fourier components, bigger than twice one of uh, this. Uh, Shannon theory. So it's a basis. So this is spatial pixels, which is a real name of pixel. You know that pixel means picture element. So it's picture. But there are other possibilities. You can just in front of your CCD camera, you can put a grating or something which is dispersive with respect to wavelengths. So you change wavelengths into space. Okay. So then you, you, what you will see on your spectrometer, because any spectrometer is like that now, is uh, frequency pixels. I don't know how to name that. Frixels. Frixels, you like it? <laughs> frequency elements, okay? So they are the same, but before you, ha you put some dispersive system. They're very, also very common. Then you have time, time cells. I don't know how to say that, but usually they are called time bins in uh, many papers, okay? So this is in case where you have a signal, de time-depending signal, so now you are in time domain, and you are just recording the signal or with a, a sampler, okay, a sampling device, so it, which takes, you put in your memory of the computer the average of the signal into some temporal gate, temporal window, okay? So I have the same thing now, but in time. Okay. And here also, of course, it will not be the basis of all temporarily varying fields, but only the ones which have not a very high uh, Fourier component in time, in frequency. Okay. So here also I can put, uh, so there are Fourier uh, couples here. I can put also spatial pixel and, and uh, Direction pixel, I don't know how to say that, but it's, you know that it's very easy in, in, uh, in optics to go f in, in Fourier space, in spatial Fourier space, because you just have to put a, a lens, and the lens, when you go from the, f the plane, the focal plane before and the focal plane after, it makes exactly the Fourier transform. So what you have is uh, when you put your CCD camera in the, in the FF plane, then you have the the spatial frequency component directly, okay? So it's very easy, you just have to move your detector, which is not the case, unfortunately, in time, frequency time domain. Okay, <clears throat> since we have many modes, and of course I will show other modes possible than these, it's important to know how to go from one basis to the other, of course, so it's mode basis change. Okay, so I have two. So I, FM first, of course. FM is my first basis, but I can choose in, on this list or in other possibilities another basis that I call GN, okay? Um, so this, here also I will write things in terms of 
uh, of column vector sometimes if I find it convenient. OK, so this I, I will call f. This one, fg. OK, it's, it's a vector, so I can put something that is not very convenient, something like that. OK, looking like a bit of a cat, because it's the same. Yeah. Oh, but I, OK, I didn't. Sometimes it's useful, because then you, you, you can use what your, you know about quantum mechanics to classical things. OK, but of course, the size here is the size of modes. OK, it's the space spanning the number of modes that you need for your problem, not the, the space of quantum states, the number of photons. OK, okay so in between what, what you have, you have a transformation, which linear transformation, which preserves what was written here, the orthonormality of, of the function. So you need a unitary transform. OK, so you write that uh, G, for example, is U, and I call it UM, F. OK, so it's a unitary transform because I'm in Hilbert space. But it's a unitary transform of modes. This is why I put M, OK? It's it's not a unitary transform on either space of, of quantum states. OK, with the dimension which is different. OK, so uh, what I will write, so I don't want to spend too much time, but the, a given field, E plus, OK, that you span over the first basis, E m f m. RFT can be also written as, so sorry, now I take uh, to be perhaps more consistent, I put the same letter for the field and uh, for the components. So, uh, so FM, FM, or GN, GN, GN. Okay, so these are the components complex components on each, uh, on each basis. And then if you work it out a little bit, you find that the column of F, so F1, etc., is the, tran the transpose. You have to be a bit careful about that. This is why I don't want to go into too much details. Is UTM. One, etc. Okay, so in order to keep the same value here, of course, if you transform that, you transform the other one in the related way, in the complementary way, <laughs> and this is achieved by something which is here the transpose and not the Hermitian conjugate because this is not a scalar product the way you write it usually because there are no stars on this part. You can put it if you want, but okay. So you, we know how to change components, modal components, when you know the change of, of modes, OK? No problem. OK, so this was mathematics, simple, simple mathematics. OK, let's do a bit of physics now. So what is important in optics, unfortunately, is the fact that the optical fields usually are not completely mastered. Okay, and the light coming from the sun or from an usual sources of light, I don't know, fire and things like that, has a lot of fluctuations. Okay, fluctuations of phase and amplitude. And uh, this lack of coherence, it's the way we we say it is a very important problem of optics. When you take light from the sun, you want to make interference ranges. It's possible, but it's difficult, very difficult. OK, you have to take care of that. So this problem of coherence is at the center of things in, in optics, in classical optics, and of course, also in quantum optics. So there is a link, a very important link between modes and coherence, and optical coherence, because coherence 
is a word which is used in many different uh, contexts. Okay? This is a coherence that is the one of the title uh, Co Coherence and Quantum Optics book of uh, Mandel and Wolf or uh, Goodman book, uh, all these people. Okay? Okay, so let us take, let us assume that we have a field that we master completely, okay? A perfectly coherent field. Mastered field, let's say. For example, now there are some single mode lasers which have line widths of a fraction of the hertz, okay? So meaning that uh, during a few seconds, they are perfectly uh, sinusoidal variation. You know that it is a, usually you put, you assume that an optical field is a sinusoidal variation, but of course a real uh, optical field uh, that you have in an experiment is not like that. Of course it has this kind of thing with fluctuations on amplitude, phase, and all that. Polarization. So if I take a perfectly ma uh, mastered field, then I, this one I call it G0 in G0. If the field is completely mastered, I can give it a name, okay? And this is a solution of Maxwell equation. For, uh, just I have to normalize it, okay? So my field E plus will be just E0, G0, both known, okay? So if you deal with coherent field, then you don't need modes. You don't need mode basis, all that. You are single mode, okay? Perfect coherence. Single mode system. So notion of mode is not so important. Just you have to, of course, know what you are producing. Okay. So it's not so easy to understand. For example, if you take a a frequency comb. Okay, what is a frequency comb? It is something which looks like G, G0, okay, of R and T. So it has some spatial variation, which can assume to be a TN001, for example. So I write it this way. Okay, so it's a laser beam in space, uh, nice one. And then in time domain, it is something which is a sum of components E of, what is the name I gave, NZ because it was, it's an NZ of E and Z, E to the minus omega zero. So it, I am in the framework of this uh, thing. So the case zero Z has been included here, plus NZ delta omega. Okay, so I superpose in the in the frequency axis and in the yes, frequency axis because I'm summing frequency omega components which are like that, scanning from some minus value to a plus value. Okay, so I have something in the middle, and here I've taken three. Okay, this is a comb. This is why it's called a comb. Okay. So it looks multi-mode, okay, because there are many frequency components and can be very, very high number, okay. Uh, usually 100 femtosecond TISAF mode lock laser has 100,000 modes like that. So come with a lot of teeth, okay. So it looks multi-mode, okay, in the basis of frequency components, okay. But it is single mode because it's, everything is mastered. So you take this as a mode, okay? So this is single mode. So this kind of extended definition of a mode has to be, okay, integrated in some way. So a mode is something well-defined. It's a solution of Maxwell equation, well-defined. Not simple, not always simple, okay? Okay, the so k-vectors, I put it in a... But each mode has a different... Each, uh, uh, in the... It depends. In the, in the, you mean... Uh, in the 
No, I am in the slowly varying envelope approximation. So the, the k vector, uh, I'm in both. So the k vector have not a, a big expansion. So this one is not, doesn't span too far in the, in the frequency space. And in the time space, it's the same for, for the variation. Okay. Of course, I can complicate it, it if you put everything. It, it will be a also a mode. If you look at uh, octave spanning thing, then it will be more complex than that, of course. Okay. Good. So all this kind of thing is interesting. Only in the, not only, but I mean, mostly in the case where you deal with incoherent fields. Oh, partially coherent fields. No, partially coherent fields. Then in this case, my field E plus spans as a way, but I will take uh, a number of mo NM. Now will will not be infinite. I take a part of the spectrum and assume my, my field is described like that. So it's always a decomposition on the modes with some amplitude EM. But now, so this is a basis, so it's, it's mathematics, so it's uh, well defined. This is physics, the amplitude of, so this quantity is fluctuating, it's random. Okay, this is a classical randomness, it's a randomness due to the fact that we don't master the emission of the light from the sun, for example, or, or even from, <laughs> from a light bulb like that, we have thermal fluctuations that we are not able to master unless we cool, cool the system, but then we have no light. <laughs> okay, so there is an average to make or fluctuations to take into account in a, some uh, stochastic uh, variable ensemble. So I, I, we, we will have mean values so I will put, so this classical, classical fluctuation, classical average, I put a, a bar. So it can be either uh, average in time and more rigorously in mathematics, it's average over an ensemble of, of uh, fluctuations, okay? In this case, okay, I will have also X, uh, EY, M, okay? I will have also mean values for the quadratures, for the real imaginary part of it. And uh, more importantly, no, I mean, everything is important. I have to take into account the fluctuations around the mean, okay? So I have a, a fluctuation quantity around zero, which is uh, when I remove from the field, fluctuating field, it's mean, okay? We will use that also a lot in uh, quantum part. Okay, so this one is around zero. Then I can calculate the variance, delta EM as a, the mean of the square of that. Okay, so it gives me the fluctuations and in each mode, but I have many modes and nobody tells me that these modes are correlated or not correlated. So I have to consider a very important quantity, which is a correlation that I wrote. Uh, Sorry, uh, here I, I was a bit too fast. This quantity is complex, so it's uh, sometimes uh, difficult to handle. So I will deal mainly with the uh, quadrature components, okay? Real really imaginary part. So here it's x, m, for example, or y. And then there's a variance of this one. And then I have also the correlation, c. I write it x, m, x, m prime. Too many squares. Okay, so I have to take into account the effect of fluctuations in in modes and between modes. Okay, so with that I construct something which is called as a covariance matrix.
and call it the real covariance matrix, real, because they are dealing with these real quantities, okay? But it's a big matrix, okay? I don't know if I have the room here, because it will contain here all the delta squared EX1 and so on, and all the delta EY squared, etc., and as many here as there are modes involved in the system. So this is NM here, my number of modes that I use, okay? So my, my covariance matrix is 2NM by 2NM. Here I have the, the CXX, here, okay, I'm the CYY, and here the CXY, okay? My quantities here, you see, X prime, sorry, uh, are real quantities, classical quantities, they commute, of course, so the, this and this is the same. So the, my matrix components are the same here and here, but just transpose, okay? Just to be symmetric, C transpose. Okay, so this is a matrix. If the fluctuations are Gaussian, which is often the case, but not always, this is enough to completely characterize the coherence, okay? So this has different names in the classical optics, coherency matrix, uh, all these kind of things. When it is for polarization also. Okay, and we, of course there will be the same kind of matrix for quantum fields. Instead of having the bar, and we have a quantum average, okay? Okay, <clears throat> so in my uh, Fresnel plane phasor things, it means that uh, EX, M, e Y, M, and my mean E field will be here somewhere, okay? But around that, I will have a Okay, a domain of fluctuations of amplitude delta Cx. Okay, that's a way to, usual way it is. Uh, but also, I mean, it's more difficult to write. I have to consider uh, Ex m prime, Ey m prime, with another mean here. And then I have fluctuations here which can be correlated, so I cannot draw that on the blackboard, so it can be like, like that, there will be x, no, x is here, x correlations, like that. If we, fluctuations here is always accompanied by the same fluctuations in the other way, okay, like that. Or anti-correlations, it, it is like that. We will have that in quantum domain also. Okay. And a very important uh, quantity that you know also is the, the autocorrelation functions first order, second order, and all that. So I just consider here the first order correlation function, which depends on a lot of variables, on two field positions. So here I'm on the basis of modes, whatever the mode. Here I consider, and because it's well uh, established in the literature, the, how the field varies. So the correlation in the basis of space and time, infinitely small bins. And this is the quantity, which is the mean of E plus star of R and T, E plus, so I didn't put, yes, it's okay, R prime, T prime, mean. Okay, so I take my complex field now, at two different positions, take the conjugate of this one, and average it, so correlations of fluctuations at two different points in space-time. Okay. <clears throat> if you open all your books on coherence, you know that it is the quantity which gives you the the quality of interference. Okay, the contrast of interference when you have a, a young slit experiment with two two points, two openings at R T for one and R prime T prime for the other. And so the ability to have perfect destructive interference between the two is related to this quantity. Okay, I will not go to that. But what I, I will consider here is just the fact that is this is related to the single mode, multi mode case. Okay, so let us now consider a single mode case. 
single mode field, but fluctuating field. Okay, so I consider that my field E plus is only F1, so E1, F1, E1, fluctuating, F1 of R and T. Okay, so among all this quantity here, only one is fluctuating and the other are zero. Okay, this is a situation that you can encounter. For example, if you have been able to select a mode in the light from the sun, okay, you have selected a frequency, a, a direction, polarization, so you are in single mode, and this mode is fluctuating. Okay, so I will not make the demonstration, it's very simple, but uh, time is passing. Uh, so, oh, sorry, I removed that also. It's the fact that if uh, field is single mode, so field single mode, It's equivalent, so you can demonstrate that it goes on both ways. That what I call the G1, which is a small one, which is a normalized big one, which is G, the big one, R, R prime, T, T prime over root of G1 of R, R, T, T, G1, sorry. T1 of R prime, R prime, T prime, T prime. Why is it useful to consider that? Because there is a Schwartz inequality which tells you that this quantity is smaller than this one, okay? Than the one on the denominator. It's just Schwartz inequality. And so meaning that G1 in modulus is always, so this quantity is always smaller than one. Or equal. Okay, so this is why it's interesting to consider it. So, this is a field is single mode, then it is equivalent to say that this is of modulus one. Of modulus one. So this is important. Okay, if my field is single, so it's very easy to de to demonstrate. You put this expression inside here, so you have always to average over E1, because this is a common part, and the average is the same in the numerator and the denominator, so it, it cancels, okay? So you find that. So if you feel a single mode, G1 is of modulus one, so equivalent at perfect interference. Perfect interferences everywhere. So it's good news for experimentalists. So if you want to make perfect interferences, very nice fringes, you don't need to master completely the field. You have one degree of freedom that you can leave uh, unmastered, okay? Why? Because in an interference uh, device, of course, what is important is the difference between the phase corresponding to different paths. And uh, the, when you have here a fluctuating quantity, it's, this one is common, okay? So in the phase difference, which is what is important in uh, interferences, this cancels, okay? Fortunately, so you don't need the fraction of a Hertz laser to make interferences. <laughs> okay. So all the, f the fields fluctuate in, in a way which is defined by a single number, okay? This is what's in what is important here? Okay. I don't want to go into too much details. So, and just put now, of course, if you have more than one field, one mode, then you will have some kind of incoherence coming. Okay, we will go back to that later. Okay. No, now I have something which is my last paragraph here is the, the 
complex covariance matrix. So you see that here I define something in a 2NM, 2NM space, which is not the space of modes. It's related, of course, but it's not just, for example, this, the dimension is twice the dimension of the modes. So the complex one is uh, more convenient in one way because it's more related to mode changes, but it deals with complex numbers, so it's less convenient than this one in other examples. So my matrix, um, so I decompose my field E plus in some basis, sum over M, so what I wrote here, yes, M1 to some number NM, number of modes, NM, EMFM, RMC. So I have my complex fluctuating quantity here that I can just use to build a matrix C M M prime co correlation also, uh, which is a mean of E M E M prime. So here <coughs> there are complex quantities, but and there are commuting, no problem with the order, okay? And I put the star because it has to be related with intensities. And intensities is a modulus of something, so it has stars. And, okay. So this is a matrix which, which is NM, NM now. So it can be considered as an operator acting on the modes or on the components of the field in the modes. And uh, if you want to write it the way I, I, I wrote it uh, some way, it's the product of them E1, E2, EM, ENM, like that star, E1, ENM, here, okay? This is something like that. Not, not the reverse, because if I do the reverse, I have a number, okay? I have a, and so this gives an NM by NM matrix, which is uh, this one. But if you remember a little bit uh, quantum things, okay? So the, this is not a scalar product, because scalar product is a given name, number. It's, it's the other, it's psi, ps it's not psi psi, it's not related to that, but it is, a, it is psi psi on the other way. Not, not equal, but I mean it's uh, remind us something which has the same stru mathematical structure, okay? So which is density matrix, okay? So density matrix is, tells you a lot about fluctuations in, in the field. So it has been built for that to, to have a nice expression for means, for quantum means. It's the same here, okay? And what is nice is that we will be able later to just map things on, the, on here. And uh, it's also well known that uh, the density matrix allows to account in the same mathematical uh, object the quantum fluctuations and the classical fluctuations. So it will be a good, uh, good tool. So what about factorization, um, uh, diagonalization? <laughs> Diagonalization. So here it, it could be any mode, any mode basis. But of course, there are mode basis which are more or less physical, more or less related to the problem uh, under consideration. And a way to extract modes, interesting modes from any mode is, like, is find the eigenmodes of the systems. It's true when you have a a crystal, by refringent crystal, you have a matrix of indices, and of course, if you diagonalize the matrix, then you have the, the eigendirections of the crystal and all the things like that, okay? So diagonalization, you can do it here. We'll go back to that also. On the real matrix, on the 2NM, 2NM, because it's a symmetric 
matrix, so it can be diagonalized. But it will be diagonalized by a linear, trans linear orthogonal transformation acting on two NM components, okay? Two NM, two NM orthogonal thing, which is not a mode transformation because it, it will act differently on the X and the Y. Okay, you can have different coefficients at will, but you choose at will for that. So you can diagonalize, it's important that we give you things, especially if you have these two blocks which are not related to each other, not correlated. But it's not a mode basis which is diagonalized. Okay, so you cannot, then you can say things about fluctuations, okay, but not about the mode corresponding to these fluctuations. Here it's different. This matrix is also so the real one, okay, not not mode basis, not mode change, basis change, basis change. The complex one, smaller one, is has the right size first, okay. Here also we not go into the mathematics, which is simple, but okay. The complex one, when you diagonalize it, you diagonalize it by the transformation acting on a space, uh, now a, un a unitary transformation because it's a complex thing. And this unit transformation, you can show that it is a unit transformation on the mode, the same one, okay? So you can change by unitary transformation the mode basis, and this mode basis will allow you, allow you for sure to diagonalize the fluctuations, the matrix, okay? and gives eigenmodes by mode change, okay? By a suitable mode change. Okay, and then if you, we'll go back to that also, if you, by this diagonalization, you, you find a matrix which now in, an, in this new basis, okay, you have only terms here. So you have only a term under the first term, which will be E1 squared in a new base. So let's call it F now. F1 squared, F nm squared. So it's a, my components Fm in a new basis Gm, uh, F. Okay, whatever the name, <laughs> the new names. Okay, you, so I have changed the basis in a right way so that my, my covariance, complex covariance matrix now is diagonalized, okay? So I have only things on the diagonal. If in this diagonal I have only one term, okay, then all the others being zeros, then this will be a single mode system, so I will be back to, to this, okay? If not, then the number of non-zero component, meaning the rank of the matrix, is uh, indication of the number of modes on which you have to put some fluctuating quantities which enable you to reproduce the complete fluctuations of the system, okay? But what is interesting is the diagonalization, you have uncorrelated things, okay? You have only fluctuate independent fluctuations in these different modes, but these modes are not simple ones. And of course, it depends on the, what you are dealing with, but there are modes like, like the mode lock laser mode, okay? Something which can span over a big number of simple modes, okay? Okay, so now I will give you just example, experimental examples of uh, classical uh, studies about modes. Okay, and then next, uh, this afternoon we begin the, uh, to, to go to the quantum domain. So this needs a screen. So there are many interesting things that have, have been done and are done uh, on the classical part of optics, enabled by the fact that now uh, people have these SLM things and this, uh, multi-pixel detectors, and they are able to, to play with that. So I will give you, so I have time, three, three examples about that. So 
Second time. Yes, this is the one I pressed twice yeah. now. It's okay. Okay, this is my title. <laughs> uh, title. <coughs> so you see, I put uh, also classical because, uh, of course, the basis of quantum optics is classical optics. Okay. Uh, yes, I forgot to say that I'm coming from Paris, from Jussieu Laboratoire castler Brossel. Okay, with a lot of, uh, and uh, which is in this uh, Jussieu building now, no asbestos, you can come and visit us uh, without any problem. <laughs> okay, so this was just a, a, a recollection of the old time in, in Les Ouches. So the, the, the first time, first time I came here, I was 75 uh, as a young student. And so it was a, a one month uh, session, but we had some stops in the afternoon <laughs> <laughs> and in the weekends. Uh, and uh, so this, this was just uh, in front of here. So you see that we were making physics also. And so this is uh, Mike Feld, perhaps you know, so rather famous. He, he, he passed away, I think. And so he was. Uh, important physicist at MIT, Mike Feld, here. And it is one of his students. <laughs> Ron McNair was a uh, very good uh, karateka. So, so we had some demonstrations like that. Okay. So we have to mention uh, Ron McNair. Uh, <coughs> he, he became then an astronaut because he was good in physics and good in uh, sports and all that. <coughs> so he made several shuttle uh, travels in the in space and then died in the shuttle explosion, in the, the first one. Yeah. Okay, so now back to physics. So my first example is this one. So it's a paper which appeared uh, some years ago, uh, not far from uh, Jussieu, so on the other side of the street. Uh, no, at this time it was in, not, not yet uh, in this part, it was a bit 200 meters from the last 300 meters. So it's uh, in uh, ESPCI, perhaps you know this uh, physics uh, engineering school with uh, Sylvain, my former student, and uh, people that you may know here. So uh, in optics, of course, the light goes through media that we do not uh, handle, which are not simple, let's say. And uh, for example, disordered media. And it's interesting to have some idea of what uh, is, uh, characterizes this media. Uh, okay, so and the, the way of configuring modes uh, is a way to, to do that. Uh, sc the scattering medium that they use was kind of paint. Okay, so they put on the on surface uh, paint, which is oxide grains uh, of zinc, zinc oxide. Uh, in very large number, but it's white, so the light goes through. It's not absorbed, um, but it uh, goes through in a way which is complicated, um, multiple uh, scattering. But what is important is, uh, it's of course, what is at the output of that is complex because it's a result of a lot of different phases and different propagations, but it's fixed. It's, uh, it's not a medium which varies in time, at least uh, it varies very slowly in time. Okay, so it's a random work that is, can be measured in some way if we are, people are clever enough. And the, the number of modes, uh, I have no time to go into this kind of thing, but it's also important. Uh, of course, the propagation, the, the, the fact that Maxwell equations are, are Maxwell equations, I mean, they, and not other equations, means that uh, there are propagation effects, um, diffraction and things like that, which of course, uh, blur the information. So the, the number of interesting modes in modes in which we can make this kind of decomposition is limited also by diffraction. Okay. If you put to details which are too small, so in some ways, not, they will then go into a, a whole space. And okay, so I have no time to go into this kind of thing. But what is sure is that when you shine light uh, through this kind of medium, you have speckles, 
fixed speckles, and, and they depend on frequency also. So how to characterize it? Okay, coherent and deterministic. Okay. So the experiment is here. Okay, laser. Okay, expanded laser. Then this very nice system, which is SLM, special light modulator. The one they use is this one, made of liquid crystals, here by reflection. So by putting some voltage on uh, each small part of, the, of these things, one, you can change the phase. I mean, this one is a phase only. So you can change <laughs> the path in reflection, the optical path that you have in reflection on, on this thing. And since you can address by electronics all these points, you can change the phase in all these points. Actually, by a factor which you see uh, uh, on the order of the wavelengths. So you can have all the fa possible phases on, on, the, on an oscillation of the, of the field. Okay, and you, it's not very fast, 50 hertz, but it's enough for most applications. It's a SLM, so it's a liquid crystal, so it cannot be very fast. There are other ones which are different. Okay, so then this is here. So you have a reflection, so you can have a di some wave here, plane wave mostly from the, your laser, and then you put phases like you want on each pixel of the SLM. Okay, so you have two pixels. You have the pixels in, and then at the end of the thing, the pixels out, which are the ones of the CCD, CCD camera that you use to record the information. In between, you focus the light on the sample, okay? Not too much, that's the right way so that you have you know, the number of modes that you address are the equal to the number of input and output modes of uh, the SLM and the CCD camera. Okay, so by shining different kinds of light here, okay, different, you can have different information, different speckles at the output, okay, and you record the speckles each time. Okay, perhaps we can have to write some things. So the, so I call E plus out the field after the painting. Okay. The, the, this layer, okay, you, it is decomposed. It is, will be a combination, so it's on a given basis, on a mode basis, and that, can, that has to be optimized. So my M are the different components in these modes. Then, of course, you have the, the mode basis in, and this one is N. Okay, and of course there is something in between that they call KMN, which is a transmission matrix of the system written on the basis used at, for the input and for the output. Okay, and the, <coughs> the game, of course, is to, to know that thing. Uh, the number uh, it spans here because of the number of uh, CCD of the pixel, 256 different modes. Okay, so at the in, so you, it's a field effect, okay? KMN is on field, not on intensity. So it's always a problem in, in, uh, in optics. Of course, you are measuring intensity and you are interested in phases also. And uh, the, so you have to make some kind of homo, uh, holographic recording. So what uh, they used, Of course, because what is measured is that, okay? It's intensity. So, so the N here at the output are the just pixel number, okay? So the pixel of, of the CCD camera. Of course, uh, this is this one. But if you just do that, you will not have the total information. So you have the K, M, N, E plus in N, but then you use kind of reference plane, which is S M squared. 
Oh, sorry, I forgot something, which is a phase here. E to the alpha. So you have to put uh, this, okay? And of course, now in the double product here, you will have the phase information. And so it's a uh, holographic technique. And then you, you, you have to scan. So you take alpha equals zero, pi over two, pi, three pi over two. The four phases. And by having these four information, by making the, the right combination, then it, it eliminates the, the terms which are not the right ones. And, and you get, um, with that, it's called the four phases. I think you know already. This gives KMN. So in the experiment, you see that there are, it seems that there is no reference beam, no SM, so no plane wave <coughs> added. Actually, you have to read the paper to, to know the detail, but the, this part of the light, which is not governed by the SLM, which is not phase changed, then which diffracts in the, in the objects, is used as, as a reference. And it's enough. Okay. So in the light, which is, there is a modulated part, which is this one. Okay. It depends on the, what you put on the SLM pixel. And the non-modulated part, which is around, and the mixing of these two gives rise to this kind of some, a bit more complicated, but of course it eliminates the need of a plane wave. I have to throw it rather simple. The basis that I use on the input mode was not the basis of just uh, light on a given SLM pixel and no light outside, which would be the, this uh, pixel basis that I've uh, given before. It was what is called the Hadabar basis, which is a combination of those. Okay, so full black, black is plus one. Black is not, uh, okay. No, black is black, okay, there is no, nothing good. You have to look at what happens when there is only the reference and not, uh, okay. And then uh, half black, half not black, or the, and in different directions and all that. You have another combination of the pixels which is more convenient to make calculations after. So these are the four Hadamard basis modes in the case of a four pixel problem. Okay, so this is uh, what you do. And uh, okay, if you look at the speckle just by sending without any change on the SLM, you see that on the screen, and this is what is recorded on the CCD. Uh, okay, pixel, um, uh, speckle. Then you send, you test the transmission of the system by all these bases. So you change the, the field here, okay? In order to have all the information needed to, to build up the, the transmission matrix. And then you have your transmission matrix, okay? With this transmission matrix, now you know everything about this complex system, okay? All the information is there. And you can use it now to do something. And for example, you can use it to focus light through the scattering medium. Because you, you ask yourself what is the light that I need to send in order to have at the output a given CCD pixel, okay? And so you have just to inverse the matrix and this will give you the, the intensities and phases on the different pixels that you have to put in order for the light after all these passes to concentrate on a given point. So you can, after a, a painting layer, paint layer, focus your light, for, sorry, for example, at this point, okay? But you can also have something on, uh, focus on three points or four points, and anything you want on the other side is correspond to a given input. You can play with that. This is what they did, so it's very nice. Another thing that you can do is to diagonalize the matrix uh, what I said before, here it's a bit more complicated because you have uh, different uh, sizes of bases. You can do that uh, here and here, okay? So number of pixels on the, which are, you can steer on the SLM and the number of pixels that you can measure on the CCD, okay? They are not always the same, so it's not square matrices things or rectangular matrices, but on rectangular matrices you can do almost the same as you do with 
square matrices, which is what is called singular value decomposition. Okay, so you can extract also things looking like eigenmodes, which are called singular values. Okay, more precisely, you can have your matrix M, which is a rectangular one, which is a diagonal matrix with with values on the diagonal in the middle of two unitary transformations, but which are different. So you change basis in a different way in both sides in, and are also not in the same phase. One is on the number of pixel CCD and the other on the number of pixels SLM. And here is a histogram of value of lambda of the eigen modes of singular values. Okay, uh, so the most uh, so the most uh, likely value of the singular value is uh, the biggest one, so me meaning that the system is trans transmits a lot okay, on these different modes. So these are the modes which are the most transmitted, 60%. Not perfect because, of course, the painting is not perfectly white. And then there is this distribution, which uh, is the one that you can calculate, of course, that you have experimentally, and but also that you can calculate by uh, using random matrix theory. You assume that your medium is random, and uh, so from that you can have this information about the statistics of things. Okay. Okay. This is one example of uh, manipulation of modes, which gives you a lot of information on, on the system. Okay. Mimo. Mimo is a very important thing, and everybody has that in at home. Uh, already in the Wi-Fi, in the Wi-Fi transmission, of course, also it's a lot of information which is sent by microwaves, and there are spatial variation, and so this is a way to optimize the transmission between the emitter of uh, Wi-Fi uh, microwaves and uh, and your any receiver you have, your computer, and all that. Okay, MIMO, multiple in, multiple out means. So this one is a thing coming from Bell Labs. Uh, just uh, something that you may know also, capacity crunch. Do you know of, about capacity crunch? It is uh, what will happen in a few years. Yes. If you consider the increase of the capacity of all the transmission channels of the fibers in the world, uh, all that. So it, some time ago, the capacity was much bigger than the, the use, okay? Uh, because, uh, the, because of this uh, wavelength division multiplexing and the uh, RBM amplifier and all that, the possibilities increased a lot and not the use, which the use increased. It's more slow, as always, something like 60% a year. So it doubled every six, uh, one year and a half. This is, uh, very impressive thing over a very long way. But then, of course, when you create like that, you transfer more and more pictures, movies, uh, commercials on the internet, anything. A lot being not very useful, actually. <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, you be closer and closer. You are closer and closer to the limit. Okay? The limits are set by what? By uh, physical things, which is uh, nonlinear effects, in the, which gives crosstalk by a Raman effect or thing like that. So there is a, a limit uh, in the capacity of single mode fibers. And this limit uh, is not written here, uh, it's, it's not far. I've written here, what is it? No, I've not written it somewhere, but we, we are all something like half now. It depends, of course, on the fibers and the use. But we're not very far from the limit of single mode fiber uh, transmission with the fiber as they are below the, the ocean and all that, okay? So there will be some problems within a few years, okay? Which is called capacity crunch. So how to increase? Then we to do something to have more channels or better channels. So in the, so far what has been used mostly is uh, frequency, okay, wavelength division multiplexing, time, with, before there was time division multiplexing, there are a lot of communication signals in the same waveform, uh, that's it. 
Polarization, okay, two, it's better than one. <laughs> But it's, it's already done, okay? They use polarization now, some subscribers. Uh, quadratures, it's a recent use is quadrature, so it's called DPSK and things like that. Uh, phase shift keying, so you, you, you in, in the Fresnel plane, so-called Fresnel plane, okay? You, you, what is used usually is intensity, so one, zero, okay? But people can use phase, one phase, this one, zero, opposite phase, but they use that, four, and even more, now there are 16, or perhaps different uh, phases, okay, <laughs> in, in the Fresnel plane. Okay, but there is a limit also, which is now quantum limit, not, all, not only, but also. So how to go further? This possibility is space, okay? Space meaning more spatial modes, either in the free space, like for Wi-Fi, or in the multimode fiber. So the trend now is to use multimode fibers, but these fibers are not in the, under the ocean so far. So they will need money, a lot of money, to be uh, built and uh, developed also. So I think that internet will be not free for a very long time, which is perhaps a good thing. Okay, so just the context. People in communications are looking for better ways to transmit information. And the MIMO concept is a way to optimize this transmission over many modes, because usually when you have many modes in a channel, okay, you have crosstalk. When you sign information on a given channel, this information goes not only to one channel, to, to many, okay? And of course, you have a transmission matrix like before for the different ones, and it's not good if you mix your signals with the signal of somebody else. Okay, so one needs to do something which uncorrelates the different modes. And this is a, the way MIMO does. Uh, so you have a MIMO encoder which gives your information on different modes. Usually there are spatial modes, but it can be anything. And you have a MIMO decoder, so it's really related to the previous example, which extracts different modes. And so this, this is the information, but of course, if you work in a mode basis change which diagonalizes the transmission matrix, then you will have uncorrelated modes. And so no crosstalk. So the MIMO is just a way to extract the uncorrelated modes from a physical system which, by, of course, correlates modes because there are some imperfections. Okay, so, this, uh, so it's well known in microwave domain for 10, 20 years now, or Wi-Fi. Now it's getting in the optical region, so it's coherent optical MIMO, co-MIMO. Uh, so the same kind of thing. So this one is Wi-Fi, okay, wireless channel between. So you have different antennas. You have on, on your free box, you have seen different antennas. This is the MIMO. Now I think there are... The new free box box is uh, there are no antennas, but I think they are inside. And, and if you use um, optical channel, fi op multi-mode fiber, it's the same, of course, because of multiple reflections, in, in, you will mix the modes also. So this is an experiment which uh, uses a multi-mode fiber, uh, just a demonstration experiment. Okay, so here it's a two in, two out uh, system, so two channel in, two channel out. So the laser is divided in two parts, spatial parts, kind of uh, um, razor blade or something like that, uh, which are modulated by uh, phase coding, okay? Phase plus and minus, so it's four phase here. Um, okay, so if you, if you have a field or field with minus sign that you send in different ways here, okay? You, this propagates in the fiber. At the output, this is divided by one another. It's just, it's a coupler, multi-mode coupler, let's say, okay? No. Something which couples, but not in the same way the different modes on two outputs. And then you have to measure the same kind of matrix here and diagonalize it, okay? To measure the matrix, they use something that we will use a lot in the following, which is a balanced homodyne detection, homodyne detection. 
which allows you to directly measure the quadratures, okay? as you will see, as you know already, I think. Um, okay, so the, this part is homogeneous detection, meaning that you have your optical signal here that you divide into two parts. Then you mix this signal with a local oscillator on one and a local oscillator defaced by pi over two on the other. And then you measure here the result of this interference and this gives you uh, the, the two quadrature components, okay? Yeah. At the quantum level, it's the same, except that you have to be careful about vacuum noise coming in different uh, ways, okay? But it's the same kind of thing. So here they are able, they don't need this kind of trick, okay? Because they measure directly the quadratures. So they are able to have directly the KMN uh, thing. Oop. Um, so when, when you are just using these two output modes as information modes, and the, on the other side they just commute, the, they put signals, of course, what they see uh, is kind of blurring of information because of noise, and, and so you don't, you cannot, uh, so this is signal, uh, you have these two, channel one, channel two, so the, these two outputs, okay? So in the two outputs, you have already information about all the input channels mixed, okay? Then I don't go into detail what is the difference between blast and equalization. I, I don't know anyway. <laughs> you have to read the paper in more detail than me. But it is a way that when you, have ex you, when you know the KMN thing, by computer, by uh, data processing, you extract the information on the eigenmode, okay? So you take the right combination of the signals, which is the information about the eigenmode of the transmission system. And first you have to know that. So before sending information in the channel, you send what they call the training symbols. So you, you shine enough symbols, not perhaps not in this basis, but in any basis, to be able to have enough information about the thing. Actually, but they do that by a maximum likelihood uh, process. Uh, knowing the information they have, what is the best transmission matrix that will give rise to this information. It's better than just inverting the matrix. Okay, then what they do, if they do that, they data process, okay? So it's not a measurement of the mode, it's a measurement of the previous mode, okay? What they have, but then process in such a way that they have access to the eigen mode. And then this eigen mode, you see, is much better, much nicer, no noise. And so it's, uh, you, the bit error rate with this kind of signal is much better. Okay, so it's another thing. So then my last one is a, a spatial mode manipulation. So this is uh, something which has been done mostly in uh, Australia in Hans Bakker Group with a strong collaboration with uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Nicolas Treps. And uh, it, uh, the, the, the main guy in the thing was uh, Jean-François Morizur. It was for his thesis, uh, which it was, was a joint thesis between Australia and France. Okay, so it's, the, so the idea is uh, mode conversion. So you have light in a given mode, GM00, mostly, for a laser, okay? And you want your light to be in another mode that you can master, okay? It's uh, important for many applications, okay? So is there a right way to do it? So it's spatial mode here. So, and mode converter will be something for if you put this in, you have this out. Uh, okay, what to put? The first thing, uh, the first idea, of course, is to put a, a filter, attenuation mask, okay? You put a filter so that this filter transmits only the mode you want. So you put your light and you decompose it first in, in the basis of the new thing and all the components which are not the one which is uh, transmitted are removed and you have only the one mode going out. So attenuation mask, it works. This is a way people do it usually. But this is introducing a lot of losses, of course, because you get rid of all the light which is not in the, the right mode. And losses are, is something which is not good in any problem, but 
which is completely detrimental for uh, squeezing for non-classical properties. Here, you know, do you remember squeezing? Squeeze light is light which has a less fluctuation than vacuum fluctuations in a given quadrature, and of course, much more on the other because Heisenberg is there waiting. <laughs> uh, okay, so if you, and this is losses from zero, no losses, total losses, okay, in a system. So you, when you shine coherent light, light which has the same uh, fluctuations in both, Okay, it is not sensitive. I mean, the, the shape, of course, the mean intensity goes down, it's the last, but uh, the shape is the same. A coherent light goes through a lossy system and is still coherent with a smaller amplitude of the coherent state. Okay, but if you take something which is not symmetrical, so with, oh, with less than here, and so more and more squeezed, okay. Like, so 9 dB is a lot of squeezing, but this is something that can be done experimentally, okay? Then you see that this kind of thing, uh, the squeezing, corresponding squeezing goes uh, to zero when you add losses. For example, somewhere here, 60% losses. Whatever the input, okay, we have almost the same bad squeezing, few, few squeezing. Uh, so you have spent a lot of time uh, and use a lot of PhD students. <laughs> to be able to produce this kind of thing, okay? A few years work. And then after uh, you know, 80 dB, uh, you have almost nothing, okay? So you have to try to keep your experiment in this uh, part, okay? So, oop. So the color has changed from Mac to <laughs> So it's a surprise. You see something or a little bit? Okay, solution is, there is a solution to, to have now a lossless, a unitary transformation from one mode to, to the other. Uh, okay. It has been given by a, a Russian paper, right, from mathematics. Okay, so it's for him thought to find a paper. <laughs> and they say that if you want to go from one mode to another without loss, a unitary transformation, you can achieve that by a series of, oh sorry, multiple phase profiles, okay, so in given plane phase profiles, or SLM, okay, some phase that you can adjust, plus Fourier transforms, okay? And this gives any unitary mode transformation. But the number of modes, the number of steps depends on the, I mean, the Different, the, the more different the two modes are, then of course the, the more you need uh, steps, the more steps you need. So, for example, uh, one wants to go from TM00 to TM2030, um, okay, stay in the basis of uh, Hermit Ghost modes, and it turns out that you can do it by three or four st steps. Okay, these steps are consist in, in phase profiles, so SLM modification of the system, and SLM in reflection can be rather good in, uh, in terms of loss. It's not perfect, not far from being perfect so far, because people don't care if they lose 10% in uh, SLM uh, in this kind of thing. Okay, but we care. <laughs> And uh, then Fourier transform, and Fourier transform, as I told you before, is just FF transformation in events. And then you do it again, and phase, and all that, okay? So many phase, but uh, depends on what you need. So for, for example, a, a simulation, in, you want to go from zero, zero to two, zero. And this is uh, what you put on your SLM in uh, modulus and phase, okay? So, and you, the best is to have the best phase here. And uh, you, what you see is that uh, oh, oh, it's difficult to, so here it looks like GM00, okay? So the, the beam of light and then it diffracts, but uh, okay. And then you put the right phase on all different things and at the output you have that, okay? So this is theory so far. Experiment uses this, can, this one are the ones which have the less losses. It's not SLM, it's a continuous mirror which, with actuators. It's more like uh, uh, for, for the astronomy. Uh, 
but they are on a much smaller scale, of course. Uh, so it's smooth phase control and not so much losses. 140 actuators, okay, but a bit of commercial, Boston micro machine, and here is the experiment. So instead of, of course, buying many uh, phase uh, systems, of, uh, one needs one and a lot of reflection, different reflection on the same, because one doesn't use all the pixels at the same time. So the input light is a TM00 here. It is then uh, reflected by a PBS, by polarizing beam splitter, once, goes here. Then it is changed in phase, in uh, polarization here from this to the other, so it goes through. Second time, and then change again polarization like here, I don't know where exactly, so that it goes out on the PBS after three, three, yes, uh, three phase changes. And of course, you put your lens here at the right place, so that it's the FF transformation for the propagation. Okay. And here, what you optimize, for example, to, to go from 0, 0 to 3, 0. Input mode is 0, 0. After the first uh, phase transformation, you have that. Second, this, third, this. And here we need four. And it looks nice for GM30 mode. Okay. In real, uh, in real life. <laughs> okay. And here it's squeezing. So you put squeezing and you expect to have squeezing in the mode at the output because we, uh, for reason that I, if I, I expect to have some time at the end to make measurements below the quantum limit, you need modes, special modes having specific shapes on which you put squeeze light. So this, is, this was the aim at the beginning of the experiment. And... Uh, Starting from 5 dB squeezing, okay, so 5 dB is below the standard quantum noise. Uh, then uh, Jean Francois and the colleagues were able to produce 1.6, which is much less, but still something, on the 1.0, 1 1.4, 1 1.4 on the other. And mostly this was due to the reflection problem on, on the SLM. Okay, so this was nice, and uh, we used that for an experiment after. Then uh, Jean-Francois finished the thesis, and he had uh, he's a, a guy which is oriented to applications and industry and all that. So he, he founded a company which is called Kylabs, uh, which he, he, they were able to raise money, a lot of money. It, and now they are in uh, Rennes, in, and uh, two other uh, PhD students, uh, doctors from. Uh, my group then went with, with him to, to build that. So it's a very nice uh, race or, because it's, they are not the other, only ones to that. And they are beginning to sell things to telecommunication companies to be able to put in the same fiber different input in the same multimode fiber without losses because also you, when you, it's important in this case. Okay, so if you want to know more about that, you look at the, their website. Okay, so it's okay. I've, it's my time. I will stop here. Thank you.